Good morning, EO. Is it still morning-ish? Um, it's such an honor to be here. Truly, truly such an honor. I've looked into the backgrounds of a few of you, and I'm like, well, what? how do you choose who's on stage? Like, um, I, I think I'm excited to be here because I can tell that this is a group of people who have always felt perhaps a bit unorthodox, perhaps a bit like you were charting your own path, or at the very least, attempting to execute a vision that wasn't something that everyone else expected. And that's definitely been my life, to say the least. I, I'm not entirely sure if there's much I can teach you, to be honest, uh, but I, I do hope that at the end of this, you at least know that you're not alone in charting that path. And for everything that you've accomplished and everything that you hope to accomplish, that it's almost, I think, to a certain extent, why you're here. It's this shared experience. Um, and, you know, and for me, this is, it, it's funny, back to back this week, I have the honor of speaking in front of such an accomplished audience like yourselves. And then next week, I actually have something similar. Um, I, <laughs> next week is actually my five-year uh, reunion for Harvard Business School. Um, and don't like, oh, I, like, I know I just dropped the Harvard. No, I don't, don't no, that's not what this is. Like, I, 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 I've been like dreading it, honestly, because again, like I never, I remember being in school, being in class, being like, I don't feel like I'm like you guys. Like everyone's talking about this, like leverage, leverage, you know, or like, I don't know, debt. I'm just like, what, what, are, you, what are you saying? Like, I just want to build things, you know? And, um, you know, it's funny. I was looking back. I'm like, well, you know, I've, I've done okay, you know, over the last five years. Um, you know, I'm very proud of the company that I have. I, I'm like, oh, this is, I, I'm excited to be able to say that I've built a company that's doing amazing things in infrastructure and in power and data. I'm excited to be able to say that I have investors like Disney, like Magic Johnson, who's wonderful, by the way, um, like Intel. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it still always felt a little bit like I got there despite everything we were taught. Uh, you know, I, I made certain decisions. I, I, I chose to look at the world in a specific way that very much was not the status quo at HBS. And I constantly felt like I was pushing against the grain in that way. And so already I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to have to get back into all of this and, and explain how I didn't do exactly what they told us to do in class to get here. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, I get um, an email from someone named Clayton Christensen. How many of you know who Clayton Christensen is? Okay, so he's like super legit. Like he's, he is the, he's a super tall, like, is he Mormon? I don't even know what the whole deal is, but he's, he's like super tall, super smart, and um, he wrote this book called The Innovator's Dilemma. He also wrote The Innovator's Solution because, let's face it, when you make enough money on the first one, you'll find a way to write the second one. Um, and he, he works with organizations all around the world to help them figure out how to innovate. And what he found was that the, the dilemma was that the thing that makes you successful will surely be the thing that kills you. And I think it sounds like a lot of people at these top Fortune 100 companies were like, well, that's fucking horrible. That sounds bad. That sounds, that sounds like a, a disaster. If you're telling me the things that make me successful, the things that allowed me to get here, the same reason why some punk little company is gonna come and mess my stuff up, you know? insert Sears, insert, you know, whoever looking at the, you know, the incumbents looking at this world saying, what can I do? And so he did all this research and he comes in and he says, here are the things that you need to do to kind of change things. And so he sent me an email and he's like, you know, the reunion's coming up. It's going to be the classes of 2014, 09, and I don't know, I think like 2018 or something. Um, and he's like, and we're selecting five companies across all those classes that represent the innovator's dilemma, like the way to address this, and we want you to speak. And I was like, oh, I was like, me? That random girl that barely felt like she made sense for all that time, you want me to speak? And they're like, yes, yes, we, we believe that what you've built on Uncharted Power 
you know, represents how you can create a culture for transformative innovation and how you can move things forward. And I was like, oh, okay, right. So what you're saying is all the time when I was sitting in class and I was like, this doesn't feel right to me. I don't know necessarily what is the right way, but this doesn't feel right. That what I was thinking, what I was feeling, and then ultimately what I ended up doing was something that you've now written in your book, made lots of money. I've seen no royalties. We've, you, I, you know, we, we've discussed that. No. Um, and so that, that, was, that was interesting. And so we had a conversation and he said, well, tell me about the decisions you've made. Talk to me about the things that perhaps everyone else would have said do X and you went ahead and you did Y or perhaps even Z. And I highlighted about five things, five moments as a, as a leader and as an, as an entrepreneur where I said this, these kind of felt like these tenants for me, these opportunities. Uh, and so he said, well, there you go. Yes, I, you know, what you felt wasn't wrong. Um, and we're, we'd love to share this with, with your peers. And so fortunately though, I'm here because it's next week, so you guys are gonna get this first. <laughs> so look at that, like you save some money on a HBS degree, right? Um, and so he, I'll do my best to share with you those, those experiences, those moments. Um, and hopefully I think, like I said at the end, you'll see some moments in your own life as well where that's parallel, where that's mirrored. And ideally, it'll get you to a place where you feel like in your own organizations, you can cultivate innovation. You can create a space for innovation to grow free and, and really be the driving force, right, behind everything that you're doing. Um, but it can't be planned. That's just the key thing, like no matter how much money or foresight, it actually can't be planned. It's going to be very specifically in the culture that you create, in the community that you create in your, on your, at your organization, and then you kind of just let it happen at these key decision points that seem natural because of the culture that you have. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. You guys ready? Yeah. Ish? Ish, maybe, should we put the music back on? Maybe, no? Okay. I'm always ready for a shimmy, don't, listen, why not? Life's too short. Okay. So the, the first thing, when I was going through this narrative with uh, Clayton, I was like, well, the, the first thing I thought about was that we, we very much, for me at least, felt like it was important to bridge the gap. Uh, what do I mean by that? So. I'm a dual citizen of Nigeria and the United States. Do we have any Nigerians in here? <gasps> There's always a Nigerian somewhere. <laughs> I guess it's me, oh my gosh, the pressure. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, for those of you who don't know Nigeria is you know, a developing world uh, country. It's an amazing country, but at the end of the day, there are still some very basic things that we may take for granted uh, that they, we don't have there. And so I, this is a country where, you know, my father still lives in Nigeria, most of my family still lives there. And I would go there every single year, uh, just for whatever family event would be happening. For some odd reason, every year, someone was either getting married or dying, which sounds sad, but like in our culture, like, we, funerals are amazing. I was about to say we kill it at funerals, that doesn't make sense, but, <laughs> like, but, like, but it's, like, it's like a party, it's a, it's a thing. Um, so, and so, you know, uh, as I would go, I would experience these issues that were very much um, at their core infrastructural, uh, even though infrastructure at the time for me felt very scary, right? So we're talking about a place where when the sun goes down, that could be the end of your day. We're talking uh, about a place where to get something as simple as light, you are going to either need to bring in a kerosene lamp or bring in um, a diesel generator. And these things are horrible for the environment, they're horrible for the people who are living in these communities. And so I specifically remember when I was 17 years old, and I was at my aunt's wedding, uh, the power went out as expected, power would go out several times a day. And just to keep the festivities going, we actually brought in a diesel generator, but we had to keep the windows closed because the pastor didn't want the noise from outside to disturb the sermon. And the fumes were so bad that I literally thought I was going to faint. 
And it, it was some, I don't know what it was about that specific time, but it was just so bad that I started to complain, which is actually very much part of my innovation process. Just a complaint to everyone who will listen first. Uh, and my cousins, who were in their 20s at the time, said something that I will never forget. They said, don't worry, you'll get used to it. And I remember thinking, what exactly are you asking me to get used to? You know, is it, you know, it, it, clearly this is bad. This is not good for me. This is, essentially, it sounds like you're asking me to get used to dying. Because if you're telling me that I should just ignore this problem that you know is horrible for me. Like, in fact, living with a kerosene lamp is like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Then what are you asking me to get used to? And I think even worse, you, these are young men in their 20s, right? When they should see the whole world as their oyster. And what you're telling me is that at this point, you can't imagine any public-private partnership, any innovation. You're telling me that the way you've chosen to solve your problems is by getting used to dying, essentially. And so that stuck with me. And I knew that there was something very much wrong with that. So the question is, how do you solve it? What kind of innovation could come about that can address that? And rather than going far away from this world, sitting in New York and thinking, how do I solve this problem that's happening in Nigeria and other places like Nigeria? I said, well, what if we could bridge the gap between what's working and what's not working in this community so it feels more natural, it feels more homegrown? Because at the end of the day, while that is a very, very sad reality in Nigeria, there's also so many amazing things about Nigeria and about being Nigerian. And I'm proudly Nigerian, make no mistake. And that's key. I didn't feel like I need to leave that part away to be an innovator, to be a leader. And so when I leaned into that and I looked around me, I said, well, the times when I see my cousins actually show, I think, the passion and hope and belief in themselves that they need is in particular when they're playing soccer or when they're playing football, as those of you who are European would probably more rightly call it. Um, and so I looked at that, and these are the times when my, my cousins, these same cousins who were very much below average at sports, by the way, not particularly good at any of these sports, it was, this was the time when you know, we'd go to the pitch and they'd say, oh, I bet I can make this goal, or I bet I can do this, or I bet, oh, I can do this thing that we saw Beckham do. And I'd be like, Adya, I really don't think you can. You're very, very bad at soccer, right? <laughs> and the thing is, nine out of 10 times, couldn't do it. But that one out of every 10 times, he did. And I was like, that hope, that excitement, this sport, that is beautiful. So how can we bridge this gap? Because what we need at this moment to me is yes, an infrastructural solution. But to do that, you need a lot of people to believe that, a, that the change is even possible, that they even have the power to make a difference. And so the first thing we need is a psychological innovation. And so that's where the idea for the socket came about. The concept being that if you can take something that people love, take something that gives people agency, take something that's tangible, take something that's good in this community, and bridge that gap between what's working and what's not working, you can then bring people along and create something that could hopefully change lives. And so that's what I ended up creating. The first prototype was shit. Don't, I don't want people, people need to know, it was a shit prototype, okay? Like you start somewhere, it was like a hamster ball with a shake the charge flashlight. It, it was, literally, that. <laughs> um, but then you build from there, and you build. I like to say that I have a PhD in Google, and I Googled my way to a product that we were able to distribute um, over 50,000 units across Nigeria and uh, Latin America as well. And so here, it's a video of some of the work that we did once the socket actually came out. So, that's where we started, Bare, sort of. That, that's obviously a great video. Where, like I said, where we started was with shit prototype in my dorm room. Um, so, you know, again, I, I, bridge the gap. And something like an energy generating soccer ball can come out. Uh, but that obviously, still feels a little bit far away from a power and data infrastructure technology company, right? It's like, that's, that's, this is great. 
This was something that not only, I think, served the, the purpose of inspiring people like my own cousins uh, to, to understand what was possible, to feel like something as big and scary as power wasn't totally intangible and far away from them, but it also did the same thing for me. Like, this, made, this situation brought me into this space, a space that I thought was also scary and big and wild. And so now everything became this, this, this new world. And I had to think about what would be the next step. And so continuing down this conversation with Clayton, he said, well, how exactly, what, what, like, did you then say, okay, now I'm going to build this company? I said, oh, hell no, what the fuck, like, what are you talking about? The fuck, like, I made a motherfucking soccer ball. Like, that's, a, it's a soccer ball. <laughs> the fuck are you talking about, Clayton? Mind you, this Mormon man was like, Jessica, I would really appreciate it if these curses would not make it into your presentation. Well. <laughs> And I was like, whatever, man. Well, listen, I'm from Harlem. Whatever, man. Like, what do you want from me? Um, you called me, Clayton. You called me. I literally was like, ha ha, I made a mistake. You called me. No. Um, so, so I said, okay. So, well, like, what was the next thing? Uh, and he was like, what, what, what was the next moment where you, you know, most people would have said maybe the way to solve this problem that you saw with your cousins was to bring more kerosene lamps or bring more solar lamps and you, you created this. What was that next moment that you felt like you saw things in a different way? And so for me, you know, I kind of summarize that as, you know, serve the ignored. And specifically, what am I talking about? So we had developed the socket. We started working with different nonprofits around the world to distribute the, the product and do different educational programming. I was in a refugee camp on the border of Jordan and Syria. And um, it was a Save the Children camp. We brought the, the balls and we were doing work there. And I looked around and I was like, where are all the girls at? I'm like, what the, what's, what's going on? Where's, where, where are the women? And they were like, oh, well, you know, things are really tough in the refugee camp. Um, people are just kind of very antsy. And so we found that all the girls, once they hit the age of 12, they need to be kept inside because they're seen to be too tempting to the boys. So I was like, okay, first of all, <laughs> first of all. No offense, y'all, but I was like, it sounds like the boys need to be kept inside. I'm very confused about this, organ this setup. <laughs> I was like, I'm not entirely sure. Not entirely sure why the girls who did not do a goddamn thing had to be kept inside. And they were just like, excuse me, Jessica, this is the border of Jordan and Syria. Like, this is not wherever the hell you're coming from. I was like, okay, fine, fair, fair, fair. So like I said, I, so I start to complain. My first thing is to complain. Like I go to the camp head and I'm like, this isn't fair. Like these girls, they can't play soccer inside. They're in these little tents. Like, what are you talking about? Um, and they're just like, this is what this is. This is the culture. I was like, all right, cool, cool, no worries. Science will rule the day. Um, and so I go back and I think, okay, this isn't fair. Um, these people are being ignored. They're not getting access to things that uh, will allow them to also handle this very traumatic experience. How can I create something that works well inside? And you know what, just to kind of stick it to them, what if it can be even more efficient? The soccer ball, th uh, it was one hour of play would give you three hours of light. I'm like, how about something like 15 minutes? gives you an hour of light. Like, I just wanna, I just wanna, just a little bit. Um, and so that's where our next product came from. Like, at, at the end of the day, you know, the, the core technology was this concept of an embedded micro energy system that can go into something like a soccer ball. And then it was like, well, now that I see this opportunity to serve a group that's ignored that I feel personally close to, let's create something else. This is how the next product came about. Let's take this same core concept and put it into something that's just as popular and as ubiquitous, I think, as soccer, jumping rope. But it's something that you can also actually play with inside. And so that's where the pulse came from. And that's when we started to understand what it would mean to think beyond a soccer ball and just expound now to other products. Do you guys wanna see how this works? I don't have a cool video. Aye, aye, aye. If any of you have ever wondered, what does black girl magic look like? Like in the flesh, what does that mean? How does that work? It's jumping rope and heels.
So again, the idea being, it has to be a good jump rope first and foremost. It has to be a good soccer ball first and foremost. You have to think about creating these technologies so you can amplify existing behavior. Bring people closer. Give people the power that they need. I have to jump a little more for this one, probably. And so it's as simple as that. I'm sorry, I'm not giving you guys enough love over here. They put all my stuff over here. I don't know, I'll come over here. Um, so that's how this got created. Serve the ignored. Um, this ended up being an even better product. This, I mean, you don't get these arms from nothing. This ended up being a product <laughs> that I used. <laughs> Why not? Um, and so, once we created two products, and I knew that there was a way to perhaps spread this out now and stretch a bit and think about this as more than just an idea to inspire. Like maybe this could be a new way to actually think about power. Like I don't, maybe this isn't just about telling people, no, look, there could be a solution. What if this was the solution? I was like, ah, like that's, that's how I started to grow into this, All right? So I started to expand my quote unquote business plan, which I did not have. Um, and I started to, to think, okay, so what do we have here? We, if it can go on a soccer ball, if it can go on a jump rope, it probably can go into anything that moves. And so we start to think about that, start to think about this world, right? And that's essentially what we start to look at. We said, um, okay, if, if we turned everything into a source of power, right? So if you think about energy, uh, energy technologies, you're looking at either generation, storage, or, and, or transmission, right? A lot of times people focus on generation and storage, but all three need to be working in concert. And the problem we found was that the way the current, like at least in the United States and in, in countries that want to mirror the United States, the way people think about energy very much did not match what we were doing. In the United States, people have very centralized energy systems, massive 100 megawatt power plants that are transmitting high voltage energy hundreds of miles across different states. So much power is being generated that you can't even have a battery that exists in this world, right? That can actually carry and store that power. And I was like, that's very different from a soccer ball. That's very different from this concept of decentralized, distributed, micro packets of energy being generated from everything that's happening, being transmitted with much more freedom and flexibility where they need to be, being stored in decentralized and distributed areas as well, so you have a more dynamic system. And so when we started to create these products, I said, well, you know what, team? It, we can't force fit our generation solution into this ecosystem, so we're gonna have to build our own world. It is what it is. I, I don't feel like, for, like in force fitting, I just don't feel like it. And when you think about it, a lot of new renewable energy solutions, that's what they did. Solar, for example, is a renewable, intermittent generation solution. Sometimes there's sun, sometimes there isn't. And what they've been trying to do is force fit themselves into a system that was set up for coal, that was set up for non-renewables. So we said, well, we, we know we can't follow that path. We'll, we'll die. It won't, it won't make any sense. And so how do we start to rethink energy transmission and energy storage? And we ended up developing quite a bit of IP in places that were previously ignored. We developed something called wireless mesh uh, networking, which is uh, actually, it was a, a patent. A, a, you guys can look it up, actually. It was a very, one of my most exciting algorithms, which, by the way, just FYI, an algorithm is just a process. So don't let anyone scare you with those fancy words. Like, I, ha, listen, ladies, if you organize yourself to look good, 
you, that, there was, that was an algorithm. That was an algorithm. That's what I'm trying to let you know. Like, don't let anyone use these words and be like, oh, what's, I have several algorithms patented. It's not that serious. It's just a process to get things done efficiently. And like, I'm sorry, if you're a mom, you are basically a mad scientist. Like, I'm just putting it out there. Just gonna put it out there. So, so anyway, algorithms. <laughs> um, and so we started to create and develop algorithms for efficiently transmitting energy in this new way, for efficiently storing energy in this new way. And it not only allowed us to create a significantly more efficient system for ourselves, right? A system where you can say, okay, well, for example, on the transmission side, since we have so many different sources of power, we need to have a way to transmit energy and data in real time. So you know where you're sending energy and how much you're sending and when you're sending it. We need to think about storage in a more decentralized way so that you can actually keep different micro packets of power stored in different places and pull that power to charge larger things. None of these things existed before. And what not only happened, it allowed us to create a, a platform that not only was competitive with the way we were thinking about power, but something that would work not only for kinetic power, energy from motion, but would work for all renewable power. Our transmission and storage IP improved the efficiency of solar by almost 50%. I know, right? Like, what the fuck? I'm like, I didn't know. <laughs> All right? I was sitting here, I was like, and we're sitting here, we're like, oh, did we make a mistake? Did we, like, mistakenly solve the problems for all the renewable energy? They're like, oh, yeah. We're like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, why not? Because the, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Again, what's the, the concept here? Because I don't want to get too technical, but for those of you who want to see me later, and we can, I love this stuff. Um, not being afraid to build your own world. We said, okay, this isn't going to work. This is not going to be more efficient. So let's build an alternative standard for how we think about this. And it wasn't something that we thought would be massive or even necessarily for infrastructure. This was even more just for kind of smart homes and IoT. Like the concept of walking into a room and saying, um, if my door hinge generates energy, I want that to like power my phone. And so we played with these ideas and we developed this IP. And we realized this is much bigger than kinetic energy. This is much perhaps bigger than even uh, con like consumer products, you know, we started to work with companies like Intel, like Good Baby, to develop things for them, to advise them on their embedded energy strategies. And I think at the end of the day, we said, okay, this is, this is, this is something. But is it solving the biggest problem why we got into this? And that's when I realized okay, I, I think I need to now prepare my organization to do some big things. Because clearly, we're, we're, we're tapping on the door of something that perhaps people just thought was a, a, a wall. And so I said, okay, we are a company that's trying to serve the world. We're a company that's trying to serve those who are ignored. Or, or we're a company that's trying to bridge the gap between what's working and what's not working. How do we make sure we don't forget that as we go ahead and take this next step? Because we're going to have to start to do some hard things. We're creating meaningful technology. We're proofing out things that people thought were previously impossible. And you know what? It's going to have to now eventually get to the place where we're not just talking about soccer balls and jump ropes or strollers or, you know, fun, wearable things. We're, we might have to go ahead and do something really hard. Because each time I go back, again, for these family reunions in Nigeria, they're like, this was wonderful, this was great, thank you for the jump rope, but I need more. And so I said, okay, then perhaps the best way to do this is to create a microcosm. Because I myself do not represent the entire world. To solve really hard problems, you need to have everyone who's affected by these problems to a certain extent in the room. You know, I, I always tell my, my team, I am not the person to bring in. I would never unilaterally sit in a room and say, I feel like I know how to solve men's, you know, baldness or something. 
I am not a man, I am not bald, I do not understand your problem, right? I would bring in a man who was bald and say, talk to me about your problem. And you'd be so surprised how few, many people will sit down and not realize that that's what everyone should do. You'll see a group of men sitting at the table trying to figure out how to solve a problem that women uniquely face, wondering, what do you mean, why should I have women in the room? What, what are you talking about? And so, this is, this is just a smattering of people on my team. Like, truly, this is the, the majority. This is the, the core leadership team. It's like a Colors of Benetton ad. <laughs> Why? Because why the fuck not? You want to build a global company. You want to serve a global market. Your team, these are the people who day in, day out are speaking to you or whispering what that market needs. It's the things that go unsaid. It's the vibes. It's the interactions. I mean, I'm sure all of you know, have seen the research, right? I think they said that diverse leadership teams generate 19% more revenue. In a transformative innovation is usually led, I think 1.7 times more likely to be led by a diverse organization. Diverse organizations th or, uh, outperform non-diverse organizations by 35%. And so, so what was the, the decision point? What was the thing that I did? I said, okay, I'm going to find the smartest people who represent the world that we're trying to change. People from Sweden, people from Guatemala, Joshua's from everywhere. Um, <laughs> he's from everywhere, he's here, he's here, he knows. Um, Mexico, India, Dominican Republic, everywhere. What do you guys see as the issue? What's happening? And so then once I compiled this team, I said, okay, in areas where we don't have as much experience, because sometimes when you're really pushing to have that, again, that group of people that represent the world, they may not have 30 years of experience, we'll build an advisory board of luminaries in their space that want this world to change and want the world to be changed by people like this. And so then we worked together. We came together and we said, now it's time, perhaps, to not only think about what we represent internally, but also externally build an environment for ourselves that, again, reminds us of what we're trying to do. And so, three years ago, we moved our company, actually, from downtown New York to Harlem. Again, with the same concepts, almost obsessively thinking about a microcosm. I wanted it so much that to the extent that someone from my company would get off the subway and walk to work, they would see the entire world in front of them and never forget it. 125th Street is very much in and of itself a microcosm of this world. Where on 96th Street, you'll, you can meet your rabbi. On 125th Street, you'll say hello to your barber. On 145th Street, you'll see your teacher. Uh, there's, there's little Africa, little this, little that. Everything is right there. It wasn't the easy thing to do, though. Again, when we're talking about the decisions that people would make, most people would say, Jessica, you have a pretty cool idea here with a soccer ball and this jump rope and this IP. Just build an experience team behind you. It doesn't matter what they look like. Jessica, you should be in downtown New York. If not, you should... Actually, many people were like, you should be in San Francisco. Why aren't you in San Francisco? You should be in San Francisco. How are you hiring? Blah, 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 blah. Ugh. I was like, who's going to do my hair in San Francisco? That's what... That's what. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? Please. God, nah. Like, <laughs> um... <laughs> I really did say that to one investor. I was like, ah. Um, I was like, no. Like, we... Yes, it's not, it's not easy to be in Harlem. It's not easy to be so obsessive with the way that you're hiring and bringing on people to have a team that looks like that. It was not easy. Did it slow us down? Yes. Yes. Without a doubt. But it felt right. Because I knew enough to know that I myself do not represent this world. I was able to recognize that to build something that was going to change the world in the most efficient way, 
in the most direct way, in the most meaningful way, I needed to have everyone in this room speaking about this and pushing this. And that this would be the thing that would allow us to do the hard thing. And what do I mean by that? There is a parallel path where I could have just been making fun IoT things, powering things for Intel and whoever, being like, oh my God, like my shoes, they charge my cell phone, that's so cute and fun. We, were, we had all of that. You know, uh, Disney invested and they actually gave me the legal right to say that I am the real life Shuri. If you've ever seen Black Panther, yeah. <laughs> We ca called in and they were like, so Jessica, here's how we want to make all these Black Panther toys that are powered by your technology. And I was like, yeah, this is great, but I think I want to do the hard thing. They're like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I still have to go back for these weddings slash funerals every year and this Black Panther toy is not actually solving the problem. It started a conversation and that's great. You know, all of these things are wonderful, but again, I'm still sitting in the dark, or I have to jump rope a lot, and again, look at these arms, how much can someone jump rope, right? I was like, we, it, this is an infrastructural issue. And yes, infrastructure is so scary, and so big, and so like, oh my gosh, like it seems like a totally separate world from innovation and all these different things, but if that's where the problem is, and we've been in this space for a while and we've showed everyone what's possible but no one seems to be changing it, I think we're gonna have to do the hard thing. And so I said, I said Disney, I, which actually ended up being I think the smarter thing because there's more money in this, but um, I said, I don't want to do a toy. Tell me about the power situation in your parks because your parks are very much kind of a small city, a small community. And I started to talk to different real estate developers and I said, like, I have an idea to take all of our IP and basically translate it to a platform for infrastructure development. Essentially build an alternative grid. We know this is going to be hard, but how can we do this? What certifications do we need? What do we need to develop so that this is something that can be scaled everywhere from Nigeria, to San Francisco. And so when we started to actually go into this and take a deep, people were like, what do you mean build a whole new standard? What do you, what do you, mean, what do you mean change infrastructure even in the, the US? What are you talking about? They're like, everything works great. And I'm like, right, but how come when there's like a snowstorm in Illinois, I don't have power in New York? Like, does it though? You find out that the grid system in the United States is the oldest, largest machine still in use on the planet. If you look at what computers looked like in the early 1900s and what they look like now, the vast difference. The same system that we're using in the United States from 1900s, the same one we're using right now. And so you're just like, hmm, this feels like something that's, yeah, it's good enough right now but kind of feels like it's gonna be a disaster once it's not. And so we, you know, we, 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 we said, well, we, we, have some, we have something different, you know, like let's, let's take a look at this. Let's take everything that we've done and think about the problem. And I said, okay, well, if I'm really now looking at our years of experience, this is about two years ago, I'm like, the reason why the infrastructure that we have gotten used to in the United States hasn't scaled over to places like Nigeria is because of one, high upfront costs, can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build these massive power plants. And in places where there isn't as much security in your investment, people don't want to make that investment. If you do find the sucker who wants to make that investment, the development timelines are insane, seven to 10 years to build these power plants. There could be several coups, who has time for that, All right? And then even if you do that, if you're looking at the kind of this community, if you're looking at the people who are gonna be paying you back for these services, you know, like what, what is the kind of the, the ongoing revenue? The siloed delivery of these services, first build power, then build internet, then build data, all these different things means that you, it's a very inefficient process, inefficient process, a very much a, uh, something that just takes so much time to develop this whole community that you just say, I don't wanna do it. And I said that this is the reason why we're not getting things over there, where we're not able to bridge the gap, right? 
And then in addition, it's the reason why we're not even able to really upgrade the system that we have in more developed regions. And so we came together as a team, this diverse microcosm of the team, and we said, what needs to happen from everything that we've seen? We said, well, infrastructure should be characterized by modularity. It should be something that you can kind of develop piecemeal and interconnect. It shouldn't take a huge upfront cost. Decentralization, it shouldn't be something where if you knock out one big power plant, everyone's done. It should be self-healing. And multifunctional. You know that in a community, I don't just want power, I want internet and I want data, so why in the hell aren't you just building, why do I have to do three different things? Why am I working with three different companies? If you combine all these things and have that kind of more holistic mindset, not only are you shortening development timelines, you're also reducing the payback period because you have multiple revenue streams that you can turn on immediately to make this a more favorable investment. And the way to do this, in our mind, was to leverage our technology and put it into the ground. So that's actually it right there. One of the older versions. It looks like sidewalk or it looks like road. And in the ground, we essentially have the opportunity to transmit energy and data in real time, embed fiber optic, store energy. In areas with high traffic, you can generate energy. In areas with low traffic or where it does not make economic sense, you can interconnect other renewable sources. And at the end of the day, the concept was simple. It's a modular platform for transforming the ground we walk on, the ground we drive on, into a decentralized, hidden power plant. And so, thank you. And so this is what we've been developing. We're actually currently getting all of our certifications. UL is a motherfucker, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Who, anyone here from CE? I need some hookups, because these UL people are just trying to, but anyway, it's getting done. It's happening. It's being built out. Um, and it's, it's so exciting because it's, it's something that I don't think I ever, would have just sat down and came up with, right? I, but it used all of our patents. It's used the same concept of amplifying existing behavior. We have the ground, we're walking on it. Why aren't we using it? Why aren't we getting more from it? The concept of bridging the gap between what's working and what's not working, all of these things came through. And of course it was scary. Again, this is infrastructure. So when we start, we start to build this, we start to test it, we're like, but is it going to have the stuff? So we start to bring in external organizations. We found that using our system is 40 to 80% cheaper to install than the current status quo for embedding actual power cables on the ground. 50 to 90% faster to install and repair. These ranges are based off of whether it's domestic in the United States or international. 30 to 60% cheaper to operate and providing three-in-one service delivery. When you lay down these panels, you get power, you get internet, and you get a data center as well. Each one actually has a microprocessor inside of them. It's made, the encasement is made of FRP, fiber-reinforced polymer. I got really good at plastics with the soccer ball. That shit was crazy. Um, like, it really was. <laughs> separate story about how when I went to Shenzhen, everyone thought I was Serena Williams, and I went with it. It was totally a separate thing. <laughs> Like, I was just like swinging, I was like, make my soccer balls! Like, it was just like, uh, I don't know, she, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we built a new way of thinking. You don't have to trench. We have clients coming in saying, you're going to save us so much because we don't have to trench 10 feet below now that we have this new system, this new alternative grid, this new way of thinking about power. Even in the United States, the government's saying, at the very least, when someone knocks out our power system, does this mean that we can maybe switch to this? And I was like, hell yes, it does. But it wasn't until we started to get some industry people coming in. Um, 
the national grid is like, you know, the, the main utility in, in Massachusetts. And this guy comes in and he's been in the space for so long. Um, and he looks into the panels, looks at everything. And he's just like, he says, this, this is a game changer. He's like, wow. And I, I, and I pressed him. I was like, so tell me though, why didn't you guys think about this? Why didn't you fix transmission? And, he's, and finally he's like, you know what? It was the thing that worked. And so people looked at it last which is what makes sense in a standard normal business. Why go and put investment in something that's working? You go towards the things that aren't working. We went, we saw things in a different way. Dr. Zhou is like the foremost world around expert on energy harnessing. When I first met him a couple of years ago, he was like, Jessica, you know, you're really good at the, you know, the branding stuff, but let my engineers at Virginia Tech help you with this thing. You know, I don't know, I see what you have here, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, whatever, whatever, man. You know, we'll see. <laughs> Bro comes back, he comes back like maybe a year later, we 5 x his numbers, right, for his team. This motherfucker was like, Jessica, I feel like we should be in business together. I really want to work for you. You know, he stands up the point. He, we, we, we run into events. He's just like, I want everyone to know that I think Jessica's a genius. And I'm like, but he's, he's on our advisory board now. He's, he, he was like, oh, snap. I was like, yes, yes. Like he's, and he's like, how did you guys here in Harlem, in this lab, in this crew, how did you guys do this? When we have everything in Virginia Tech. And I was like, well, we, who's in your lab? Because we created a microcosm. Like, what were you thinking? Were you trying to do the hard thing? So, I, I say all this to say, you know, first of all, thank you for listening to me. Um, where, where we are now uh, is a very exciting place. We're actually building out uh, what will eventually be a 1.3 megawatt decentralized grid in Connecticut. That's the first one that will be coming up. I don't know if you're ever in Connecticut and just want to walk on the sidewalk and be like, what's happening? Is this power? What's going on? That's, that's there. Um, we're very heavily, right now I know that this is, I, fortunately there are several things I can't share because this is, there are journalists in the room. But uh, there are some very exciting things that we're also doing with 5G that we did not know we would have, been the company to solve, but as it turns out, we are. Um, and between working with the, the nation's leading telcos on their 5G deployments, between working now with you know, the cities and looking at how we can deploy this for their analytics and for their uh, resiliency, and prepping this as soon as we get all of our certifications <laughs> to get to the villages and the communities where my family still lives and they're still looking for this power. Um, none of this was planned. To a certain extent, perhaps it was my destiny, but it was only because I listened to these things that felt different, that felt like they were gonna take me off the path that everyone was talking about, but it was very much my path. And so I feel incredibly blessed to be able to say that I'm standing in front of you as the CEO and founder of an award-winning power and data infrastructure technology company. But as you can see, it, I, I would be lying if I said I sat down and knew this is where I was going to be. And I hope that what you do take from this is this understanding that there are some simple things you can do to kind of let your innovation come out, to create a space for that innovation, to create a space for those decisions that will take your company that's already amazing or you wouldn't be here to that next level that you could never dream. Thank you. Just for a couple of questions, this is an incredible opportunity. Two questions, does anyone want to drop in a question? Right there, Dorothy, can we get a, a, a microphone there, please? I can talk loud. Perfect. Oh. <laughs> um, amazing presentation. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I thought solar roads were really cool too. Um, I think that it's a material science issue in particular there. Um, and so if you, one of the slides that I had up, uh, there, the woman there that was from Guatemala, she's actually a PhD in material science and investing in material science early was pretty key to think through what materials like fiber reinforced polymer, for example, are being developed that can be, um, as durable, have the certain properties that you need, but you can get it down at cost. Um, let me come at the problem from two angles. Solar roads. Exciting because, yes, there's lots of sun. Problematic because the, the, where the technology is for solar cells right now, it's a very fickle beast, right? If the sun's not hitting it at the right angle, or if you have um, buildings in place, or you have a cloudy day, you're kind of screwed, which means that you have to put a lot of these panels everywhere. Um, in that way, it ends up being a very expensive solution. What we did was kind of twofold. One, look at different materials that were definitely more affordable, that were available um, and mass, right? So instead of using some weird widget for uh, the panels, using something that's used for different uh, bridges and things like that that we can get at a lower cost, that was big. The other was actually being power generation agnostic. We would have had the exact same problem with solar roads if we said this system only worked with kinetic generation. At the end of the day, you know, I, I believe that kinetic is meaningful. But I also believe that solar is a meaningful generation when it makes sense. I believe in hydro and I believe in wind as well. I believe also in biomass. And so what we decided then was, why don't we create a version of the panels that just does energy transmission and storage? And then we can look at a community when you're developing the microgrid, look at the most efficient way to in include the generation side. So in places that are very high traffic, we can put in uh, at a very effective cost, kinetic. In places that have more sun, we would put in solar on the rooftops, very rarely on the roads. They, they, there's a lot of things that make that not work, even also from a durability perspective and a dust perspective. We can also interconnect biomass, windmills, all of these different things. And so when you customize for the generation source within the community, you can bring the overall cost down, but still have control of that system because the panels are like the highways. They're like the roads for that energy to get transmitted, and that's where the real kind of power of the network is. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Do you have any more Thanks questions? Much. Right here. I can get you a microphone, sir. Are you ready for this? How are you dealing with snow? Because you're going to be on the foot and you get covered with snow in like places like Connecticut. So how are you dealing with the elements? Well, all the testing in the world. So we, we work with several external laboratories that do all of the main, the, the main bridges, and we beat the fucking shit out of this thing, right? <laughs> like, that's just what it is. Like, you have to. Like, you, like, our thing, I literally went in and I was like, if there's an infinity war, these panels need to survive. Um, and so that's what I was like, don't, I'm like, don't embarrass me now. Like, these panels need to survive. So, um... One is always, so, and material science is huge when you're talking about real innovation. So understanding the materials, understanding how they work. It's not even just cold and hot. The problem is the cycling. Connecticut's tough because it can get hot too. And like that actually um, makes the materials expand and contract, which can do weird things. So there's ways to design for that and have different adapters. There's also ways to treat that. Um, but mostly it's really choosing the appropriate materials and then running through all of the temperature testing, all of the durability testing, all the uh, life cycle testing that you can. And I think using an external laboratory to do that because they are not in any way... Um, you know, it's not their, they're not looking to give you an answer that you want. They're looking to do their job so they don't lose their certification. And so we've been working with um, labs that have done a lot of work for the Tappan Zee Bridge. And you know that. So they're the ones who have been hired to beat the crap out of our stuff. And sometimes we get information we don't like, and then we design and we've adjusted for that. Right now, um, we are rated for tier 22, uh, which means we're good to go not only just outside, but on all sidewalks. Uh, we are 
very close. I think we're only about five, like two actually being rated for highways as well. Um, we can do roads, we can do sidewalks. Um, we're look, getting our rating for highways, um, which means you're not only looking at the environmental scenario, you're also looking at, you know, if you have a high speed semi, you know, truck, um, you know, racing on this for 10 years, what's going to happen? And so the, the short answer is design with testing and feedback in mind. Thank you so much. Jessica will be around in the afternoon. Please give it up, Jessica Matthews. That's amazing.